the dark web, home to the truly twisted individuals of the world. Join Being Scared and I as we delve into the darkest recesses of the internet. But be warned, these stories are very dark indeed, and are not for the faint of heart. Viewer discretion is advised. I used to make a living off the dark web. I guess the correct way to phrase it was that I made a living off people's fear from the dark web. Allow me to explain. I ran a fairly popular YouTube channel. The sole purpose of said channel was to stroke the fire that led people to believe that the dark web was this ominous landscape of dread. You know what I'm talking about. My channel was no different from that of hundreds of others out there. I would rack up thousands of views from me filming myself browsing the deep web whilst playing into the notion that I could stumble onto something sinister at any moment. I never did though. The truth was, the whole thing was a scam. Not the kind of scam that legitimately ruined people's lives or anything, but every video I recorded was rehearsed beforehand. I knew where the journey would take me before I even pressed record. My usual process involved hours of browsing until I found a few sites or threads that I could milk for at least a couple of episodes. Most of my uploads were two-parters. Human trafficking, government conspiracies, satanic cults, all of it was bullshit. Just fear bait to get people to hit the subscribe button and click on my videos. People used to sit around campfires and tell ghost stories. Ghost stories gave way to urban legends. The deep web is just a modern continuation of our society's obsession over the bogeyman. The sites that I visited in my videos never yielded any truly terrifying results. If I thought that a site was too boring, I'd sometimes blur out a couple of photos on the page to give more credence to the illusion. Even the supposed deep web you might be wondering how I could keep something like this up for so long without viewers eventually dropping off the map. It's the same reason people watched the stupid ghost hunting shows. Nothing ever happens, but people continue to watch because they're teased that something might be lurking around the corner. What started off as a way to keep myself occupied during multiple bouts of insomnia became a pretty lucrative enterprise. So successful that I was able to quit my day job and make YouTube content full time. On the surface, my videos conjured up creepy explorations of the hidden internet. But what my fans did not know was that my private browsing sessions were absolutely dull. Don't get me wrong, the deep web isn't a stroll down Sesame Street. It's a minefield of child porn and illegal goods. But once you get past those things, it's pretty much the same as the normal internet, only not as organized. All of this started with a private message from another YouTube user. I was nearly done editing a video involving some random page detailing cannibalistic recipes. The whole thing had actually been debunked as a hoax a few months earlier. But, like so many other entries, I knew that if I made things creepy enough, I could pull another one over my viewers. I got an alert on my phone that I had received the message just a few minutes after I had already checked and responded to the prior message. And for the sake of the sender's anonymity, I will just say that her name is Jane Doe. The message was as follows. 
please forgive the random message, but I've exhausted all my other options. My name is Jane Doe, and I've been watching your videos for some time now. You seem to have a genuine understanding of the internet, more importantly, the controversial aspects of it. Four years ago, my five-year-old son was abducted during a local Halloween parade. I had only taken my eyes off him for a few minutes before my husband and I even realised he was missing. The police were unable to find any clues in my son's disappearance. There were no suspects, no motives, nothing. It was, to quote a local detective, as if he disappeared into thin air. The investigation continued without yielding any solid results. We finally had him legally declared dead in an effort to secure closure for myself and my family. Time passed, and I had gotten to an emotional point where I could start putting this horrible tragedy behind us. That was until two weeks ago, when I got a strange email in my inbox. The subject said, See mum, all smiles. As soon as I read it, I knew, I just knew, it had something to do with my little boy. And it did. Inside the email was an attached picture of my son. No text, just the single picture. I took the picture to the police. The email it was sent from was some kind of dummy address. They had someone analyse the picture itself. They told me something called metadata that allowed them to figure out when the picture was taken. They estimated it was sometime at the beginning of the year. And that's just the thing. I don't see how it could be possible. In the picture, he looked like he hadn't aged a day. And it's been four years. He'd be at least nine by now. And I just don't understand. As before, the police have hit a dead end. They can't tell me where the picture was taken from or who sent it. Like I said, I've watched your videos. I know you haven't done anything about missing children. But I was hoping that if there was some way that you could help. Some way. Any way. If it's about money, I could pay you. So that you know I'm serious. I sent a copy of the picture to the email listed on your channel. Please try and look if you're able to spare a moment. Thank you for your time. Jane. I checked my email, and what I found sent a chill down my spine. The picture attached was indeed that of a five-year-old boy. But something seemed wrong. Off. I couldn't put my finger on it, though. A little boy was dressed in a navy blue three-piece suit. He was sitting in a fancy looking chair with his legs crossed. But it was his expression that bothered me. His eyes were wide open as he grinned abnormally for the camera. I would check my email randomly throughout the following days. I probably stared at that picture on and off for days. It got to the point where I even began to dream about it. Finally, I took it upon myself to do some research about the photo. I put the picture through a Google image search and got nothing back. Then I logged into Tor and did the same thing through a basic deep web search engine. My results led me to a single unlisted page. The header title read, Little Darlings. Beneath the title were the words, Where all your childhood dreams come true. The background of the simply designed page was layered with tiny images of matched paper dolls. No amount of mental preparation could have readied me for what I saw next. Because within seconds, I felt like an invisible hand had reached into my chest and it began to squeeze my heart as if it were a stress ball. It was an embedded video that said, 
our process. The video was distorted. It started with a simple block of text that read, Gwen, age six, blonde, Caucasian, no blemishes, darling value, high. The video glitched to show a very large framed clown leading a young girl into a small windowless room. The little girl wore a tattered white gown stained with dozens of dark spots that could have been food or even blood. She woozily wobbled back and forth in an attempt to move forward. Text appeared over the footage. A muscle relaxant is administered orally to the subject two hours prior. As the two made their way to the centre of the room, you could see that the only visible piece of furniture was a single fraying couch pushed against the wall next to a raggedy door coated in peeling white paint. The little girl walked aimlessly with a blank expression towards the couch where the hulking clown instructed her to sit down. Once the girl became positioned on the couch, the clown pulled a deflated balloon from his pocket and began to blow it up. My stomach started to knot up. I was sure the video was about to show the clown molesting the little girl, or at least something disgustingly similar. I turned my head to avert my eyes from what I thought was soon to come. After a few minutes, I turned back to the screen to see the clown putting the finishing touches on an inflated poodle. I readied my finger on the mouse so that I could quickly escape the page once things took a turn for the worse. And things did get worse. Much worse but not in a way I could have expected. After completing the animal balloon, the clown handed it to the little girl, whose eyes lit up as bright as they could considering the current state she was in. As her tiny arms slowly outstretched to receive the gift, I watched in the background as the white door to the right of her slowly creaked open to reveal a thin individual wearing what looked like a painter's jumpsuit, the kind that you would buy from Home Depot. The cheap outfit was complemented by a blue surgical mask that obscured the figure's face from the nose down. Quietly, swiftly, the masked figure made his way from the door to the little girl. Just as she took hold of the poodle, the figure produced a syringe and injected the girl in the back of the neck. She began to seize for a few moments before going completely limp. The video quickly jumped the footage of the girl laid out on some metal table. Her clothes had been removed. The masked figure then proceeded to peel her skin off with an object resembling a scalpel. I started to gag as the twisted images shifted to the girl's detached skin being carefully fitted over a pre-posed plaster mould. The footage jumped forward yet again to show the faceless individual adding a wig, then makeup to the human taxidermy experiment. The final result was an eerie replica of the little girl sitting eagerly at the foot of the bed, placed as the centerpiece of a well-decorated bedroom. The dozens of photos displayed as I scrolled down were just as twisted. Multiple children posed in multiple settings like a clothing catalogue. Next to every child was a price tag, ranging in the high thousands. The girls were more expensive than the boys, and the white children seemed to be rarer and more expensive than other ethnicities. It wasn't until somewhere around the 10th photo 
that I noticed what had been disturbing me about them. It was the eyes. All of the children's eyes had been replaced with hollow glass imitations. In the weeks since I visited the site, I can still see those same eyes staring back at me every time I close my own. I haven't made or uploaded a video since I stumbled onto her little darlings. I don't even know how I can go back to doing what I used to do. I haven't even responded to the woman's message. How could I? What could I say that wouldn't send her into a deeper fit of despair? No, I think it's too much. As we may crave the truth, there are some things in this world that we should remain shielded from. In closing, I'm not going to tell you to stay off the dark web. All I'll say is this. I've lost my faith in humanity, and if you saw what I've seen, you would lose yours as well. This happened a few years ago. I haven't touched any technology after what happened until now. So, I've been using technology since I was a kid. At 12, I learned how to write scripts and programs to hack into systems, and ever since, I was hooked. I'll fast forward. I'm in second year university. I'm now quite good at hacking, albeit somewhat cocky. Throughout high school, I'd made a lot of money hacking. People would come to me normally to recover their hacked social media accounts, or to hack into their boyfriend's phone to read their text messages. I was known as the guy to go to if you wanted something hacked. Even my school occasionally came to me for help. If some script kitty shut down the school's website with low orbit ion cannon. Like I said, I made a lot of money doing this through high school. Halfway through my second year of university, I started getting bored of this. The money was good, but there was no thrill. One of my friends told me about this cool thing called the dark web. I had heard of the dark web before, but it never seemed that interesting. My friend told me how. It was full of drugstores, weapons dealers, hackers for hire, and a bunch of fucked up animal and child pornography. As a hacker and stoner, the dark web seemed right up my alley. When I got home that day, I fired up my computer and did some quick googling. With my vast knowledge of technology, it didn't take me long to set up with TOR and TAILS installed on my computer. I sped through the hidden wiki, finding most of the websites boring or dead. I texted my friend asking if he had any interesting link directories. He replied, here are a few of the ones I use. He sent me about five links to directories. I decided to click the second one and see what I could find. I scrolled through the directory for a few minutes. He was right about how interesting the dark web was. I couldn't figure out where to start, so I clicked on a chat room. The website looked old and primitive, but surprisingly, there was one person online. I started talking to him. He seemed kind of shady, but it was better than scrolling through a bunch of dead websites. He said he'd been on the dark web for a while. Finally, finding someone with a vast knowledge of what's on the dark web, I asked him if he had any interesting links. He sent me a link and then immediately left the website. I had no idea what was hidden behind the link. Looking back on it, oh god, I wish I hadn't clicked it. At the time, my own curiosity overwhelmed me, and I clicked the link without giving it a second thought. After it finally loaded, due to the TORS notoriously slow loading time, I was presented with a pop-up box. It said in red text, if you don't know what's next, you're probably in the wrong place. There were two buttons, continue and leave. I instantly clicked continue, the biggest mistake of my life. It brought up a black screen page with a blood red title at the top of the screen, The Freak Show. In the middle of the screen, there was a chat box. A message popped up from someone titled admin and he said hello. I said, hello, interesting website you've got here. 
He replied, Thank you. You are here to view the show? I thought to myself, What show? Out of curiosity, I replied with, Yes. He said, Since you're a first-time viewer, it will cost you $500 via Bitcoin in order to view the show. Future viewings are free. From all the money I made hacking, I had enough to fuel my curiosity, so I went ahead and paid the $500. After paying him, I was surprised. I was given a zip file instead of a link. I had developed a custom-made antivirus that appeared to work well, so I risked downloading it. When I unzipped the folder, there were two files inside, an installer and a file named readme.txt. I started by opening the text file. It just said, do not send the installer to anyone or else. I went ahead and closed the text file and opened the installer. It took about 15 minutes to install, which is strange for my computer. After installing, it opened up automatically. Across the screen it said, Hello, welcome to the Freak Show. We use a custom program for our streams. Instead of live streaming on TOR due to TOR being too slow, we also need the extra security. After about 10 seconds, the screen changed to a countdown with a chat room next to it. At this point, I was starting to feel that whatever happened next would not be good. The timer displayed that there were 30 minutes until the stream started. I set my screen name to James Kent 157 Not my real name, but I needed an alias. I said hi in the chat, but was ignored. I waited the 30 minutes, and after the timer hit zero, a video feed began. On the screen, there was a guy in a mask with three people side by side in front of him. He started speaking with a voice changer to mask his voice. He said, Welcome to the 26th stream of The Freak Show. We are happy to see all our old viewers and a few new ones. We will now randomly choose who gets to choose, who to kill first, and how to kill them. At that point, I realized I was fucked. I was in too much shock to close the window. I watched as the feed turned into a bunch of names scrolling by until it landed on someone named Gore725. I watched as he made his commands. First stab him in the kneecaps, then cut off his fingers, after that gouge his eyeballs. When that's finished, drill into his stomach and to finish him, burn him with hot metal. I watched as the sicko did all of this. I watched as the victim screamed in pain. After everything was done, he said, Now for the next one. After he said that, I snapped out of it and went to close the page. When I clicked on the X, it said, Sorry, no leaving midstream. I was trapped. The wheel popped up again, but this time, it landed on me. I couldn't respond. Instead, I typed in chat, You sick fucks. Why are you doing this? I was met with all the people in the chat calling me things like Pussy, Dumbass, Retard. I then said, I'm calling the police. I shouldn't have said that. The owner of the site said, Call the police and you'll be in next week's stream, Logan. That made my heart freeze. He knew my real name. He then pasted my parents' names, my address, my school, my age, and my IP in chat. I immediately went to the task manager to close TOR and the program. As soon as the task manager opened, it said, not responding. The guy said, don't try that in the chat room. I pulled the plug on my computer without a doubt. My screen went black. I ran to my parents' room, told them what happened, and said we had to move. They believed me and called the police. The police took care of everything and put us under police protection. Within a few months, they found the website owner. He was a 32-year-old man who lived off a combination of welfare and the money he made from his red room. It was many years later. 
before I finally started using technology again. The dark web is an abyss of terrible things. If you're smart, you'll stay on the surface web, but I can't control what you do. I recognize what I'm about to say is going to upset a lot of people. I'm not here to offend anyone. I've just reached a point where I can no longer hold this in. There really is nobody I'm close enough to. Nobody that would hear what I have to say and not put it against me. I've been living life from day to day, carrying a burden that has nearly driven me to the point of suicide. It doesn't matter what I do, how much I try and scour out the bad choices left decaying in my past. It's that same burden that stalks me every day. When I get to work, when I'm hanging out with my friends, it never, ever goes away. The images begin to flood my mind and suddenly, I can picture her face all over again. Always the same tears, the same expression of fear that was burnt across her innocent face. I can't hold her face anymore. I can't keep going on like this. I'm telling you this in the hopes that the possibility of putting my story out to the world I may be able to free myself from some of the guilt. Before we proceed any further, you should know that I'm not a good person. Don't get me wrong, I try to be, I really do, but part of me is convinced that the life I live right now will never make up for who I was and what I've done. You may come away from this hating me, and for that, I can't blame you. I've spent a good part of my life as a neo-Nazi. While a lot of guys I hung out with were doing it for the trend, I saw that life as something more. I was part of something that I really believed in. It was religion, my religion. At one time, the German people had recreated a section of the world in their own image. I saw Hitler as a prophet sent to the Aryan people to lead them into a fresh era of power and prosperity. I thought Hitler held a vision, but they killed him before he could realise it. I considered myself one of the chosen many entrusted with a flame, a flame that we could take out into the world. We could finish what our great leader had started generations ago. I know now that all of this was bullshit. We were all just oblivious cogs inside of an obsolete machine. We were young then. We were furious, angry, and we felt like outcasts. Angry that this world didn't understand us. And more importantly, it didn't even try. We were all products of broken families, abandonment, abuse. We all felt alone out there, exposed. My parents had just gotten a divorce. The split was sudden and sharp. I was 13 at the time, yet I couldn't realise why they did it. The sole thing that made it abundantly clear was that my mother insisted that I would live with her. My father agreed to the arrangement without putting up the slightest hint of protest at the idea. That part hurt. It hurt bad. I always was close to my father, closer than my mother and I could ever dream of being. I held nothing against my mother. My father and I just always seemed to click. I guess we were so much alike. But it turns out that that could not have been further from the truth. With the exclusions of a few brief visits stretched out over the years, I'd never seen my father. At least not enough of him for it to mean anything. I carried on my life from that point under the assumption that my mother had somehow been the cause of everything. I didn't know why she'd pulled our family apart. I just knew that I resented her for it. I'd find out years afterwards that the reason behind my parents' divorce 
wasn't as much my mother's as it was my father's infidelity. He had been screwing this girl behind my mum's back for about a year. I saw that nasty bitch once when I spent Christmas over with the old man. Perky blonde and stupid. I determined that my mother's obvious replacement was barely out of high school. The whore introduced herself as my father's friend. Even then it didn't take long for my teenage mind to put two and two together. It was a revelation that only made me withdraw further into myself. Every day I had to look at that thing. I watched her wander around the house in her tight t-shirts and laced panties. She never saw it as inappropriate. Dancing around the house half naked whilst her boyfriend's teenage son was visiting for a week. She just kept on doing that. Either way, she was oblivious to the inappropriate nature of her actions. Or she simply didn't care. Either one of those explanations would have changed the fact that I felt like I was being constantly disrespected and all of it falling under my father's apathetic watch. He may have been the king of the castle, but in the end, it wouldn't be him calling the shots. Rather, everything that happened in that house was dictated by a ditzy piece of barely legal ass. And what disgusted me the most was that he would make a point of indulging himself in it daily. Whilst my father kept his flirtatious gestures toned down in the beginning, he'd eventually get comfortable enough to start repeatedly articulating his unfiltered appreciation for all things jailbait. She'd grin and he'd slap her on the ass. It would be moments like these that constantly seemed to happen within my proximity. I tried to dismiss it, act like their interactions were not driving me mad on a daily basis. While my father saw a walking sex doll, all I could envision was that whore was what he chose over mum. Two days before I went home, my father began hounding at me to go do something outside the house, to sweeten the pot. He even gave me 40 bucks and recommended that I catch a movie at the theatre across town. I knew what he was going to do, and I knew that he was intending to do it with her. I heard them through the walls nearly every night. They were so loud that I would have to cover my ears with a pillow to get some sleep. Apparently, screwing after dark wasn't enough for my dear old man. Apparently, he was in the mood for a midday snack. I reluctantly agreed and took the bribe money. I had only been outside the house for a few minutes, when I suddenly felt compelled to go back in. I returned to the front door, only to find that it had been locked. I raced around the house only to find the same with the back door, with no traditional way back in. I improvised by climbing through the guest room window. I learned very quickly that it wasn't my sounds that mattered, rather the sounds that were occurring from my father's bedroom. Loud, wet gagging, as if someone was being choked from behind to the threshold that was cracked open just a few feet ahead of me. As I proceeded forward, the sounds would become more and more acute. Strange, disturbing gurgles that carried across the hall. These were the sounds that continued to befuddle me, right until I slowly pushed the door open enough for me to peek through. I was speechless from what I saw. My father's girlfriend was laying on her spinal column while he forcefully ground her face from an upward angle. At that point, I wasn't a stranger to sex. By then I had learnt the basics along with a few extra notes I'd picked up from other kids in the neighbourhood. But what I was seeing, however, 
didn't fall into any of those classes. The exchange had been proceeding on long enough to cause the girlfriend's makeup to start oozing onto the bedsheets beside her. She cringed, she gagged, but she never stopped, nor did she let my father know how uncomfortable she was. She simply lay there in complete submission. As mad as I had seen my father in prior days, I couldn't help but feel a little pang of admiration for what I was seeing. He was punishing her, and she deserved every minute of it. The explicit moment would last for about another ten, uncontrollable minutes, before my father ended with a scream that resounded throughout the empty house. As soon as my father collapsed in exhaustion, I kept watching as the girlfriend slowly gathered herself, quickly placed a hand over her smeared mouth, and kept any of my father from spilling out as she proceeded to get off the bed, taking a few disjointed steps into the adjoining bathroom. That night, all I could think about would be what I watched in that bedroom. It took me hours to get to sleep. The next morning I awakened to find my father had left early to get an oil changed before taking me back home that afternoon. As I walked through the house, I detected that my father had gone alone. The TV was playing in the living room on the couch, and there laid the girlfriend passed out, wearing her usual attire. I attempted to get her attention, but she didn't even move. I must have stared at her for 15 minutes, every second spent thinking how my father punished her. How she deserved everything she received. I wanted to practice what my father did. I wanted to punish her too. I foolishly convinced myself that I would practice what I envisioned, and she wouldn't try to stop me. I crawled on top of her snoring body and positioned myself like I'd seen earlier. She opened her eyes right as I began to fidget with my zipper. She said nothing in those first few seconds. Once it all finally set in, she let out a scream that hurt my ears before pushing me off to the floor. She then quickly dashed into the bedroom, slamming the door behind her. When my father got home, I knew that he would burst into my room shortly after. It all happened faster than I even thought it would. He kicked my ass like I was simply another guy off the street. When all was said and done, he threw me a towel, gave me enough money for a bus ticket, then ordered me to get the hell out of his house. He never told my mother why he sent me to get the bus. He never told her why he abruptly decided to cut the visits from Blue Moon down to almost non-existent. I couldn't have cared less. As far as I was concerned, my father was dead. Nobody gave a shit about me, and I wouldn't give a shit about them. I soon became the epitome of adolescent delinquency. It was during that time that I was approached by a skinhead at a skate park. They were throwing a party and inviting kids from around the neighbourhood. I decided to go, and my life changed forever. I could tell right away the people I belonged to. We were the orphans of society, but we were also the descendants of proud people. A proud race. A pure race. When you feel small and marginalised, of course your ears are going to perk up when someone says that you're better than the majority of people out there, simply because you were born with a genetic lottery ticket. Prior to joining, I never considered myself racist. I actually didn't even know anyone who was black or Jewish. Most people in my town were white, so something like that never even crossed my head. In the end, it was never about those we went after, it was about being part of something. I finally had a family of my own. My mother went off me when she found out how I was spending my time away from home. She told me that she refused to let a neo-Nazi sleep under her roof. 
I didn't argue. I went away. I ended up moving in with one of my friends, Torch. We both felt so accomplished and motivated. We felt as if we were unbeatable. My life continued on that track for years to come. I intimidated people. I offended people. I did whatever was required of me. It was a vicious cycle that would go on before suddenly derailing the moment I saw that video. You're probably questioning how a video could suddenly change a person's opinion overnight. I can tell you now, with no exaggeration, that my opinion didn't just change. Every fibre of my being changed. And it didn't occur overnight. It happened as soon as I turned off my computer. I couldn't sleep that night. So I got on the net and started cruising the usual white power websites and messaging boards. I couldn't find anything to keep my interest. So that's when I decided to boot up Tor and hit the deep web for something that I could sink my teeth into. The site installed Promised Lands. It was a deep web message board dedicated to all things controversially white power related. The sites that people can find on the surface web a light to say the least. The government set about cracking down on anything that could be considered extremist behaviour. When that happened, people took off heading to the dark web, where nobody could censor what they decided to say or do. The most extreme thing I had ever seen on Promised Land was the video of some guy dragging the dead body of a dark man behind their truck. There was no way of telling if the man was dead before they set out dragging him, or after. I'll be the first to say that I'm not proud that I watched that, but the truth is the truth. The video segmented was usually cluttered recorded lectures, how to weapon footage and the occasional Aryan Barbie doing a striptease. The lineup was different that night. The top rated video had siphoned the majority of the user votes. The title was Uncle Adolf's Wonderful Puppet Show. The comments were insane. The people writing them seemed overly stirred up for some reason. Some of the people demanded more videos like it, whilst others explained in particular how they couldn't watch the whole thing. The chatter just made me more curious. I downloaded the mp4 and clicked play. I wish I could take that back. The video was distorted, jumpy. The footage looked like it had been shot almost a decade ago. Everyone around the camera spoke fluent German, was talking to a beautiful short haired woman with a roguish grin on her face. They seemed to be inside some sort of warehouse or mill. The woman lured the cameraman over down a flight of rusted spiral stairs, and they continued talking to each other as they worked their way down a seemingly endless number of steps. The further they go, the more we start to pick up noises. It sounded like it was coming from a bunch of people. The footage jumps forward. The woman was now sitting next to a cameraman running her mouth as he zoomed in and away of her attractively rounded face. The two were sitting inside of an auditorium, old yet maintained. The interior looked as if it was made for theatre production, and the auditorium was filled with other chatty Germans. The footage jumped forward again, only now everyone in the auditorium was standing. They all hail Hitler whilst another aged anthem played through the old speakers that were wired through the auditorium. The anthem concluded, and everyone sat down. The lights began to dim just as the stage curtain started to function. Everyone began clapping. We get to see what's on stage. Stationed at the centre is a large metal replica of Adolf Hitler sitting down in a chair. The giant Adolf has to be at least 15 feet tall. There are regions of the figure that have rusted, even some of the paint had begun to crack, exposing the sharp looking metal 
behind his grinning face. While Metal Hitler's left arm was resting, the right was positioned straight up. Likewise, unlike the left, the right arm didn't end with a hand, rather a mesh of jagged metal barbs. If you looked closely, you could ascertain the right arm was connected to a jumble of thick wires that extended from the Metal Hitler all the way to a complicated looking electrical box. The old metal inside of Hitler began to churn and click. Hitler's eyes started flashing as it spoke a series of German idioms. The voice was old and muffled, distorted, like the kind you hear through a fast food drive. A man appeared on stage. He's dressed like a circus ringmaster. The only major adjustment to his outfit is his large swatch sticker, sewn onto his top hat. He's pushing a big box on wheels. The cube is covered with a black tarp that is quickly withdrawn when the man comes to a stop. Underneath the tarp isn't a box, it's a cage. Inside there's a woman curled in the fetal position. She's of African lineage. Her clothes were in shreds and she looked like she'd been physically abused recently. The louder she cried, the more the audience cheered. More men came up on stage. They opened the cage and forcefully removed the woman from her prison. While they struggled to draw her out, a strange looking contraption began to lower from above the curtain, stopping just above the raised Hitler arm. This creation was formed of mostly metal with a series of leather straps located at four ends. The men hoisted the woman up onto the contraption despite her protest. They yet managed to strap her in. She hollered, she begged. They only laughed at her though. At this point, the audio in the video would become drowned out by the animalistic screams of the audience. The contraption started up one more time. It lowered the screaming woman onto the upper side of the jagged metal. The powerful hydraulics pushed her down into the razor sharp metal, like a human eraser onto a pencil. The sounds she made were indescribable. The farther down she was pushed, the more blood flowed down the mechanical Hitler arm. After a few minutes, the woman would give out from shock. The audience started booing loudly. The ringmaster assured them that there was still more to come. And he looked at a man standing near the electrical box. He nodded and the man pulled a lever down. Sparks flew from the box as electricity rapidly travelled through the box. All the way through the metal arm that bore into the woman. Her body began to jolt uncontrollably whilst her teeth chattered so loud you could pick up the sound as well as the audience. The mechanical Hitler started to act and talk as this was going on. Moments later, the applause would be deafening. After that, the video stopped and it disappeared for the forum for a few days afterwards. Not that it mattered, I'm sure it's still floating around somewhere. Right now, some sicko is probably watching it. Me? I left all of that behind. All I can tell you now is I try to keep the pieces together. As for those of you out there who think that hate empowers you, let it go. Just let it die. You have no clue what real hate is. Real hate creeps through your blood like venom. It's a blackness that invades every inch of your body until it ultimately gets its claws around your heart. Once real hate has gotten its fill of you, it leaves behind a withered husk of something that couldn't even be called a human being. I've seen real hate and I've spent every day since wishing that I had not. It all started a month ago as my family and I were preparing to go on holiday overseas. 
my Galaxy S7 Edge was acting up on me, so I decided to turn it off and reboot it. I held down the power button, and I was brought to the Galaxy S7 Edge boot logo. It stayed there, and wouldn't boot up. I plugged it into my computer to realize that the OS had corrupted, and I needed to do a fresh install. This was impossible to do, as we had to leave for a plane three hours away from us. I had to put up with using my sister's old iPhone 5 for the holiday, since I didn't want to be charged for overseas usage with my phone provider, I decided to leave my SIM card in my Galaxy S7. Progressing through my holiday and we got to a period where there was horrible weather and we couldn't do much. I was stuck in my room, bored, absolutely shitless, so I decided to start talking to my friends. I used my iPad to talk to my friends as I had the applications pre-installed and the internet sucked to download shit. I remembered before I went on holiday, they started a new craze with the dark web. I have a lot of knowledge with computers and technology, so I knew this was a place that you shouldn't really mess around with. The group chat got onto the conversation of the dark web and started talking about all the things they have witnessed and it didn't actually sound that bad, so I asked what they were searching it on. Plenty replied with the answer, T-O-R, and others came back with application on their iPhones called Onion Browser. I thought about it. This iPhone has been wiped so many times that there would be no information on it for my sister. What have I got to lose? The pressure got to me, and I bit the bullet. I went onto the app store and downloaded it. I opened the browser up and headed over to the wiki to show me some sites that I could access. There were the basic sites, like black market type, guns, drugs, hitman services, and whatnot. I saw that there was another section to the wiki and clicked on it. The websites had minimal information about them, so you didn't really know what you were getting yourself into until you loaded the site up. I closed my eyes, scrolled down a bit, and clicked a random link. As I opened my eyes, I was looking at some website with numerous services on it. It seemed pretty clean, until all of a sudden, a chat window popped up on the bottom right hand side of my screen. Hi, and welcome new user. Thank you for coming. I replied, saying, no problem. Thinking nothing of it, I saw another message. We have a show about to start. Would you like to join? At this point, I was oddly curious about this show that the user was talking about. I wonder what it could possibly be. I replied saying, yeah, why not? I was then greeted with a bunch of terms and conditions. The one that stuck out was, if you leave before the show has ended, your IP will be blocked from the site and you will never be able to access the site again. Shit. They would have my IP? I was worried for a moment, but then thought. I'm at a hotel. What's the worst that could happen? I agreed to the terms and conditions and followed the instructions to the show. I was presented with a hidden part of their site with a blank live feed in the middle. It was counting down to the start of the show. As the counter got to one minute till the show begins, a chat box at the bottom appeared. I saw people entering messages in it. It was a chat for us to communicate while the show was happening. Nothing was really said, just a few hellos and how are yous. There wasn't any talk about what the show would feature. The timer got to zero and the live feed started. A man with an anonymous mask greeted us all. Hello and welcome to the show. If you are new here, then thank you so much for joining us. If you are an existing user, welcome back and thanks for coming. We have something special in store for you today. The guy stepped away from the camera and a light turned on. A girl in a mask strapped to a chair with only her bra and panties on. I got a bit worried and thought that she was going to be raped. I was wrong. Another chat window popped up with a user by the name 
of Scarecrow 476. The host asked, Scarecrow, please inform us how you want this to go down. He replied, Get an angle grinder and cut her stomach apart and then slit her throat. I couldn't believe what I just read. My heart dropped into my stomach. There is no way they are about to kill this girl. I was frantic and had no idea what to do. I watched with my eyes watering. The man switched on the angle grinder and started cutting her up. I felt like throwing up. How did I just watch an innocent girl get killed? I typed in the chat. You guys are fucking mental. I hope you get killed in the worst ways imagined. I'm calling the police. This was where I made the worst mistake ever. I was immediately redirected to a blank screen with a chat box. The user was by the name of Site Owner. I knew I fucked up big time. He wrote, You go to the police and you and your whole family will be killed. I replied with, I won't, just please let me go. I turned the application off and immediately uninstalled the application. I was scared for my life. I had no idea what to do. I returned home to find that everything in life seemed to be normal. I wiped the phone and listed it online for sale. A guy bought it for his daughter as a gift. He was a nice guy who was about to go on vacation for the weekend to the city. He thanked me ever so kindly, and he left. I was so relieved. I don't ever have to see that phone again and remember the horrible things I saw and encountered on my holiday away. A week had passed, and there was a breaking news segment on the TV that interrupted the show I was watching. A family had been brutally murdered. They were visiting the city for the weekend. They had been uncontactable for the whole week, and their immediate family were worried and called the police. The police found them dead in the hotel, brutally chopped up. They had no idea who had done it and wanted witnesses for people with information to step forward. It hit me like a freight train. They got the IMEI for the phone, and once they logged into a form of social media and knew who they were, someone hunted them down and murdered them. I felt absolutely horrible. How did I not think of that? I wanted to somehow help the police, but to explain why I was on the dark web and what had occurred would have been hard to do. To this day, I have extremely poor sleep and nightmares of the poor man and his daughter being killed. I will never forgive myself for the stupid mistake I made. Be extremely careful what you do, and I advise that you never go onto the dark web. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I'd like to thank my good friend Being Scared for his help in this video. He is an incredibly talented narrator, and you should definitely check out some of his work and subscribe if you haven't already. Before you go though, I really want to know if any of you have ever been on the deep web, or if you're planning to, and how many of you would actually go and have a try at deep web exploration? I'd love to know in the comments section. Don't forget to smash that like button and then subscribe, because you really won't want to miss what's next. I'm also posting some cool behind the scenes stuff on my Twitter and Instagram if you guys want to come and join the fun. But for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.